It's time to listen. It's time to focus. What haven't you been able to accomplish? What has stopped you? What has haunted you? Why are you losing sleep over it? All roads lead back to what you're focusing on and who you're listening to. Energy flows where focus goes. So what are you focused on? If you haven't been able to get it done, today marks the first day of the best days of your life. So where focus goes, energy flows. I'm talking to you. Uh, today, I'm ending uh, the series called Focus with this message on fundamentals. In fact, I was thinking of this uh, whenever uh, I was at Bible college, and it's kind of been this way in sports all my life. Uh, you typically, when coaches wanted to get your attention and they wanted to uh, get you uh, going the right direction. Maybe you stalled in your walk and your relationship with the sport that you're in. And uh, you, you, you kind of got bogged down by a lot of stuff. Uh, they took you back to the basics, back to the fundamentals. And uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, one of the NFL's greats in coaching, Vince Lombardi. And... Uh, those of you who don't know who he is, he's probably the greatest coach of the greatest football team in the NFL, and uh, that's the Green Bay Packers. I had to look, for my, look to my wife for support because, you know, I, I've been watching a lot of footage of Vince Lombardi, and one of the great quotes that gets used all the time is Vince Lombardi holding up a football and saying to a bunch of professional football players, gentlemen, this is a football. And you say, what in the world? Why would somebody do that? Well, his intention was to focus them back to the fundamentals and reacquaint yourself with the basics. And sometimes we can get so caught up in uh, the, the bigger picture that we, we sometimes lose focus on some of the, uh, the important fundamentals that need to take place. But in July of 1961, Vince Lombardi kicked off the first day of training camp for the 38 players on the Green Bay Packers football team. The prior season ended a heartbreaking loss to the Philadelphia Eagles after blowing a lead in the fourth quarter of the NFL championship game. And he reminded them that this season we're going to get back to the basics. And he also said, we will never lose another uh, championship game. In fact, he went as far as to say, uh, like, uh, competing in the tournament, we won't lose another game. And uh, I just want to say to you that that doesn't just happen. That You have to be intentional. You have to focus. And uh, one of the things he said really is you can make football so complicated. And he says, really, you just need to tackle really good and block really good. And if you do that, you're probably going to beat your opponent. And so my attempt today is going to be uh, to inspire you and challenge you that we might revisit some of the basics of what works for us. Uh, I wanted to start by just giving you an inspirational video to watch. I thought it was inspiring to me. Maybe it'll do the same for you and challenge you today. Watch this video of a speech that Vince Lombardi gave. This is what I believe football is all about. To all of these men, I want to say that football is not just a game.
Well, this is what I appreciate about uh, greatness that you see in the human spirit is there's a commitment. And I, I think what Vince Lombardi said, you know, we expect excellent or we expect perfection will settle for excellence. And uh, I think there's an expectation on us in the body of Christ to perform at our optimum, not to settle for or to drift into the monotony of good and settle. And the Lord challenged me today about a message that I preached some time ago and kind of redirected me on some of the finer points of this message. But Hebrews chapter 2, starting with verse one, number 1, it says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation of disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So uh, the Lord focus my attention today that often uh, our propensity is towards drifting. We drift. And it's really easy to do. In fact, that's, I think our natural inclination is to settle in to where we're comfortable. And uh, sometimes uh, we get bloated by uh, more ideals and things that come along. I think in sports, uh, we get overcomplicated in drawing up plans. And, and uh, one of the things that was uh, just funny to watch was uh, Vince Lombardi really mastered one play called the power sweep. And he would laugh because everybody knew it was coming, but nobody could stop it. Right? He had this, this simplicity about him. Now, I'm not like elevating a man uh, I'm not telling you that, uh, that 
he was some sort of savior at, at all, although he did make a great impact on the city of Green Bay. And he was an elite coach. And I believe he was even a, a believer. He was a Catholic brother. And one of the things that he always brought into his locker rooms was this ideal of love. Like there's this higher calling. And I, I watched uh, this whole probably hour and a half video movie, in essence, on, on him. And they interviewed his family, of course, his son, his daughter. And uh, some of the things you could just see that this man was a very driven man and maybe he wasn't as close. In fact, he, he was kind of closed off a lot. And he, uh, he was so inundated in his thinking about football, 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 football. You could see that that kind of carried through even in his relationship with his children. So I, I'm not here to say that you should do what he did. I'm just saying to you there are some principles that he established that I think are really important. And I think even more, we might do good to think about what's really important to us. In fact, I thought about this the last time I shared on the, this text. I, I shared with you the four cardinal doctrines of the Assemblies of God. Now, this was a few years ago, so many of you weren't even here when I shared this message. And uh, the, the four cardinal doctrines that we hold as these are really important, right? And the Assemblies of God has 16 fundamentals, and then of those 16, we say these are the most important ones. That, they're important that we live our lives around these things. In fact, we guard these, we watch over these. And uh, it's the salvation message. You know, there's, Jesus is the Holy Spirit baptizer. He's our healer, and he's our soon-coming king. Like, those are really important uh, uh, core uh, doctrines that we should base our lives around. We should, we should focus on these things. So, well, the doctrine is man-made. Well, these are right out of the Bible. I'm not going to sit and argue the point. In fact, uh, people that want to convince me uh, something other uh, from, the do- from the doctrine that they believe, and ma- you know, they say man-made doctrine, I-, I just point to the scriptures. You know, each one of those uh, doctrines has various scriptures to back it up. We're not, we're not just cherry picking a scripture and saying, you know, this is why you should believe this. But I, I want to say this to you. I think you can start drifting if you get away from these core doctrines. You start to drift and you start to argue uh, uh, minutia or points that are irrelevant as it relates to living a victorious Christian life, one in which we all thrive. Like to sit and argue who. Who is the Antichrist? It's just simply, it, to me, it just doesn't make sense to sit around and argue points like this. In fact, there are, the Bible teaches there are many Antichrists. There are going to be many who come and they're going to mess with your thinking on different things and they're going to, they're going to appear to maybe even have some, some ideas that match up to the Bible. Well, ultimately, you'll see them for who they are whether they're false teachers or whether they're just downright anti-God, anti-Christ spirit. The goal isn't to try to, try to uh, add so much to what we believe as, as Christians that we, we get lost uh, trying to perform a bunch of rituals and rules that, that make up religion. That's not the goal. The goal is to get us to thrive, and I think the way that we thrive is to get back to the basics, to get to the fundamentals. I hated uh, coming off of uh, the break from summer and jumping back into practices and basketball, because they were always very difficult, and the first few weeks, we didn't even touch a basketball. You just didn't. You know what we did? We ran a lot to condition, get conditioning, and we, we went back to the fundamentals of stuff. When you're, you know, your whole entire uh, fan base in your school can preach to you every time you go out to play, hands up, hips low, feet moving. That, that, that they quote, I mean, it was constantly, they had banners put up all over the place and coach had so drilled that in us. 
Fundamentally, th- this is what we're going to do. We would go into basketball games, and you would, we would run, run you know, pre-game, pre-game drills and stuff, and we're, we're, we're just doing it fundamentally the right way. And coach would know when we were just going through the motions, and he would get on our case if we were just going through the motions. And, and, and we'd be playing teams that were maybe more athletic than us, but they're going in, and they're just throwing up the ball around, and they're just doing whatever they do. And here we are. We're just running hard and and. and, and warm-ups we're doing everything with intensity and then you go out and you play the game and teams that were supposed to smoke us we ended up beating why because we were fundamentally sound this is the same thing I want to challenge you with as believers today that we focus our attention on the fundamentals what really makes us good at what we do and all the other stuff there's plenty of stuff out there. In fact, I, I've, over the years, I've had people that want me to be a, a pastor that, that does what they want. And inevitably, there's somebody who's very passionate about life. I am passionate about the right to life. But I can't only be the right to life pastor. There's somebody out there who's passionate about, you know, people being set free. And they want me to be the deliverance pastor. And I'm like, listen, I appreciate your viewpoints on deliverance, and I believe that God's people should be free too. And we could use a little more freedom or a lot more freedom in many uh, ways in our lives. That Some people are so bound and so addicted to some way of life or, or something is controlling uh, their, their existence. You know, yeah, you got to be free from that. Yes, I believe that God's people should be free. You shouldn't be in bondage to things like pornography and, you know, drugs or any, any, anything in your life that would try to deaden whatever that is that's going on inside of you. you know, like, that, like there's no substitute for what the Holy Spirit can do in, in the life of a person to bring healing and deliverance. Yeah, all those things. But I'm not going to be the deliverance pastor. In fact... We get so caught up, and there's movies that are even out today that, that, that are uh, more like documentaries on the, these subjects, and they're going all over the United States, and I, I'm like, I don't, I'm not here to argue those points, but I'm not going to become that guy. I'm not going to champion those things. I'm going to stick to the fundamentals. If we talk to people about salvation, listen, what people need is the good news. They need hope. And we have, we have the message that brings hope. So we should focus on, on salvation and sharing Christ with people. And, and, and you don't have to do that in your own power and ability. You can do that under the, the power, the unction, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he'll help you do that to the optimum, to the best that you could possibly do it. I believe Jesus wants to heal people, broken bodies, uh, people who need healing physically, people who need healing spiritually. You could be, you could be struggling inside and, and you could have an infection of the spirit that's affecting your whole life and God wants to heal you of it. I believe that. And we should, we should be intentional. These are things that Jesus focused on. These are the things that Jesus said he was anointed to do. And ultimately, he's coming Again, that's, that's the hope that we have. And I, I think if we could, we could hone our, our thinking and our practices around the fundamentals, the things that are really important, we can make a huge impact. It's usually when we start drifting and we start grasping for things to solve whatever problems we have or whatever issues we might have, and we start adding to, uh, uh, building upon the foundation that we can get messed up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on these things. These things are the important thing. These are essential. And that's, that's really what it's ultimately about, that we would, we would get to the core, <laughs> not just in our theology, but in our core values and our practices and our beliefs, what we believe are the core, the essential things that we do. And it's only a core value if we practice it, if we do what it is we say is at the core of who we are. If we do those things, then they are our core values. 
And there's, a, there's this, a, always this inclination to drift away from those essential, important things. As a pastor, that's primarily what a great part of my mission is, is to try to keep us focused on the important things. You see them posted out in the lobby. Our purpose, our core values. Peter Drucker says the successful person, that's it, plans more, I I wrote this down instead of typing and I should have typed it, I can't even read what I wrote, oh, oh, that's that's bad, yeah, we basically focus more on on, uh, right things, or doing the right things, than doing things right. And uh, I would say, too, it's not a binary choice. It means you, you don't have to do one in favor of the other. I think both of them get. You could do the right things, right? And you could focus on the right things. And I want the right thing to be the best thing that God has for us. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. And Paul says that in Philippians chapter 4. He goes on, uh, uh, whatever's noble, whatever's pure, whatever's right, You know, he talks about focusing on these things. You know, fix your your attention on these things. Uh, We're warned in uh, Hebrews that that we would pay close attention to the things you've heard uh, uh, that that don't neglect this great salvation that you have. What, What is he saying? Get back to the most important stuff. Focus on them. Pay attention to them. The right thing is not always the easiest thing. It's not always the most convenient thing. And it's not always the most profitable thing, but it is always the best thing. That we would focus on uh, the right thing as being the best thing that God has for us. And it doesn't have to be what everybody else is doing. In fact, it's probably not going to be what everybody else is doing. That we discover together what are the best things for us to be doing in the body of Christ right here in Nixa. For, For Thrive Church... We can't go out and we're not going to survey everybody and find out what they're doing and find out why they're doing it. Well, we have to allow God to speak to us. And that's what essentially we believe God has done with with the, the name of our church and the things that we hold close to. These are the practices, the things we value. The Lord just really brought my attention back to this so we don't drift missionally, that we don't find ourselves over in left field going, what are we doing here? Or we get down a path a ways and we discover, oh, we, we've been focused on all the wrong stuff. The Lord said this to us and we got to focus on that. And it's really easy to drift away from it. I realize he's talking specifically about salvation here. Hebrews chapter 2, he's talking about us paying, paying attention, pay close attention to the salvation that you've received. And I want to I challenge you that, that if we would get, get to and stick to the things that we believe God has essentially said, this is what I want you to do. You're, you, now you're not judging yourselves by what somebody else is doing. You don't look at other churches and other, other uh, fellowships or you, you know, even sister churches. And these we don't look at those churches and go, oh, we need to do that. Why? Because we're governed by a sense that this is what God tells us to do and we're going to do what he wants us to do and we're not going to worry about everybody else's responsibility, the assignment he's given to them because they might be right things and, and you could do right things, but are we are we focused on the right thing for us, the best thing for us? I submit to you, I believe we are. But I think sometimes it's in theory more than it is in practice. We say thrive in heart. We find our identity through Jesus Christ and what he has done for us through the cross. This is the, the heartbeat of what we believe when we say this is our heart. We, we want to identify with Christ and find our identity in him. We're not gonna look everywhere else. We're not gonna gonna compare ourselves to everybody else. We're gonna figure out what it is Jesus has called me to do personally. And I would submit that it it, 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 it actually is 
uh, fits into the grander scheme of things. But he isn't going to bring me before him and judge me for how somebody else was supposed to lead, how somebody else was supposed to exist, how somebody else was supposed to move and have their being. He's going to say to me, what did you do with what I called you to do? So I'm going to find my identity in him. I'm going to discover who I am by being in relationship to Jesus. And what he says about me is really what matters. Thrive in conversation. We spend time listening and praying to the Father and allow our lives to speak from that place. That we get in prayer. Fundamentals. We all, like, like it isn't, nobody gets off the hook. We all have to pray. We all have to seek God. We all have to get focused on this point that that we all have the ability to touch God with our prayer. You don't have to go find somebody to pray for you all the time. Now, there are times where where the Bible actually tells you. Seek out the elders. Let them lay hands on you. Let them pray over you. But all of us can pray. And it shouldn't be a last resort. It should be our first instinct that when we, when we uh, wake up in the morning that we connect with our Father, that we seek Him. It can't just be a, a, a you know, a, a, yeah, we know Christians pray. You know what? My prayer life has developed over a, life, a, a lifetime of serving him. I, I, I've, I've learned how to, when I first started praying, I've, I've shared this. When my very first kind of experience of pray out loud, I was in the basement of my lead pastor's house. And, and I started off my prayer, dear God, this is Chris. I'm at 220 Spring Street in the basement. I mean, I, I was going down a list. Lord, this is where I am. He knows your address. And I've learned how to pray differently. I've I've grown in my prayer life. I've spent time with him. I I, I converse with the Father. He talks to me. I talk to him. And people think it crazy that you say that out loud. God talks to me. But he designed it that way. It wasn't something I made up. He's the one who said, hey, come to me. Lay all your burdens on me. Let it all out. Give it to me. And then there's other ways we pray too. Philippians chapter four talks about this. You know, we, we need to be a, a church that prays, that we, that we learn how to have a conversation with God, that it isn't a one-way thing where I go and spit up a bunch of prayer requests and I walk out of the room like, there, I prayed. No, you didn't, you dumped. Prayer is a conversation, something that happens between you and the Father. By the way, Jesus was really good at this. The New Testament church was really good at this. We need to be good at this. Thrive in community. Again, just read Acts chapter 2. Was it 42, somewhere around there, where he talks about these are the things that the early church did. They lived in community together. We have meaningful relationships by being vulnerable and embracing authenticity. And uh, I, I, I saw this again and I'm sorry, I, I get riled up by this stuff, but I think it, it's something that we need to beat the drum on regularly. Yes, there's always the potential that you will be hurt in relationship. Community is going to bring about the possibility that somebody's going to say or do something that's going to mess with you. And I saw somebody point, they they were pointing this out about the church. This is where everybody gets hurt. And I'm like, well, duh. Have you been in the world? Anytime you get more than one person, and even then you're conflicted in yourself oftentimes of the way you think and the way you behave. How sometimes they don't match up. Sometimes they're hypocritical. Sometimes we say things and we do things that don't match what we actually believe. And and the reality is, is when you're in community, there's always a potential you're going to be hurt. Are you with me? And the, 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 the statement is, is, blessed is the one who's not offended by me. Why? Because offense is so easy, and it's a trap. It's a snare. It gets you into bondage. I think, I think the, the hardest thing for us to do today in community is to keep yourself pure from offense. Just don't be offended. 
choose to not be offended. Trust me, I've had plenty of opportunity to be offended in the body of Christ. Are you with me? Does that make sense to you? Because this is real stuff. This, is, this, is, like, this isn't just a practice Christianity. No, this is real stuff. When you're going to do life with other people, and I ask you this question, are you, are you playing the, the, the Christian walk at a distance? Are you keeping yourself walled off? Or are you uh, uh, keeping yourself from the potential of being hurt so therefore you have community, but it's not community like we describe it where you're vulnerable? I'm not talking about walking around with your heart on your sleeve stuff. Some of us, you know, like when you get vulnerable, you could be so vulnerable that it doesn't take much to hurt you because you wear everything right on your sleeve. Don't do that. Make a decision. I'm not going to be offended. He didn't say hi to me. <gasps> he must have a problem with me. I kid you not. I, I've, I've experienced this stuff out in the world, but I experienced it in the church, and the Lord has to remind me, don't be offended. Don't be offended. Don't be offended. And I know how the enemy works on my mind. When I perceive something that's not right in my mind and I let the enemy build a case, whispering in my ears, accusing my brothers and my sisters. And there's a level of trust that has to be with vulnerability. You can't just build community based on, uh, uh, well, the, the Bible commands me to be vulnerable and build community. Well, some people aren't trustworthy. Like, that's part of it, too, discerning who deserves your vulnerability. And I say that tongue-in-cheek because I realize nobody really is perfect in this. Jesus is the only one. But gee, look at the New Testament. You can't read the Gospels without realizing that maybe Jesus upset a lot of people. I think one of the most intense moments in the, in the New Testament is when uh, Jesus is late to Lazarus' sickness. And how upset Mary and Martha were with him. Right? That's pretty intense. Jesus, if you were here, he would have been healed. And Jesus said, well... I'm the resurrection of life. Well, I know there's going to be a resurrection. No, no, I am, and I can do it right now. We're not talking about the future resurrection. And and by the way, the reason this happened is so God would get greater glory. And, and, And they didn't see that. They were hurt. They had loss. I think this is important for us to understand that it's, it's so easy in the context of the Christian life when you're trying to develop community for you to be hurt and offended. But that stuff will eat your lunch, it will isolate you and keep you from community, the very thing that God wants for you. None of us are designed to do life alone. And by the way, it is hard work to develop relationship. Are you with me? Just think of it in, in relationship to a husband or a wife. It just, if it was so easy, there would be no fighting in marriage. There'd be no, like divorce wouldn't be an issue out in the world and in the church. It's not, it's not something that just happens. You have to work at it. It has to be a core value. You have to decide. We're going to risk hurt. We're going to risk being offended because we believe that it's more important that we function in community together and we do more together than we can alone. We can do more when we combine our resources. We can do more when we get together and we minister to one another. Body ministry, when somebody's down, somebody comes along and walks with you, prays with you, spends time with you. You know, these things happen better in community. And Dan, I think the enemy gets what he wants when we got folks out there just saying, well, this is, not how, uh, like, th- this is not how the New Testament church was, what we have today. Meeting in buildings. and let, I'm like, would you just be quiet? You sound like a voice piece for the enemy, a mouthpiece 
stay away from church. Well, you only get hurt at church. I've, I, I tell you, I, it's been a lot of years now I've been serving God, and there's been plenty of hurt. Probably plenty of times that I've hurt people. I'm telling you, I, 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 I'm sorry. When I do it, I, I don't intentionally go out and go, I'm going to mess somebody up today. I'm going to hurt their feelings, and I'm going to make them really mad at me, and I'm, I'm going I'm to make it so they walk away feeling justified. No, none of that. I don't walk around like that. You shouldn't walk around like that. Well, what does the enemy do? He convinces you that that community is the place where God's people are miserable people. And God help us. We don't want to be miserable people. I think you got to be well in order to build well. That's why getting the right things in us, the best things in us, is most important. Why? Because then we can build well. People, people are finding help. Marriages get restored. Relationships are established. Churches advancing in the kingdom of God. We're moving out into enemy territory and we're taking back stuff that we're occupying. Why? Because we're doing it God's way. Only the enemy can convince people that the very thing that Jesus said would happen when we come together doesn't happen, but only this happens. Negativity, tearing one another down. That does happen. In fact, Paul says that that's why a lot of quarrelings amongst us is because we're self focused, thrive in worship. We want his presence. We want his presence. Nobody can listen to me or any preacher from this platform on a regular basis and and believe that that's not what we want. Bunch of crock. People walk out and say, nah, church doesn't want that. Baloney. Baloney. I would like to say some other things about that but I'll leave it alone because I was afraid I'd get in my flesh a little bit. I know none of you ever, ever want to say things that aren't maybe the best things to say. Sometimes I do. That church doesn't want more of the Holy Spirit. Bull. Bull. In fact, I want to say that if baloney was snow, you'd be a walking blizzard. It's the truth. Some of you will get that later. We want his presence. We want his presence. The problem with many folks on this particular way of thinking is that their, their framework is, is built around a specific genre of his presence. I can tell you with 100% certainty, the most impactful times I've had with the Lord and have not been primarily in a church service. Although God has ministered to me in church services. I've had some wonderful encounters with the Holy Spirit. But, but most of that stuff wasn't revolutionary in my life. You know where God and I had done the best business is in my prayer closet or least expected times in my office, just like thinking about God and his presence and he moves in on me in a wonderfully profound way and then he teaches me something from his word and it transforms my thinking on something. Worship, we want his presence. We want to, we want to be influential. We want to We want to impact the community around us. Are you with me? I think this is one of the, this is really a dangerous thing for people to avoid. Because churches that don't have influence die. I submit to you that this is kind of what was happening to this church before we, we kind of shifted. We were we, we, yeah, we said, well, we had numbers. That's great. I appreciate it. I, I, want, I want a full church multiple times on a Sunday. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I'm kind of driven by that a little bit, God. I, the more people that fill the chairs, the more have the, the, the potential of hearing a life 
altering message, transformational, that, that could set their lives on a different trajectory. I want that. I want people to thrive. I want them to walk around with a sense of victory about their lives. Why? Because Jesus came that we might have life and life to the abundant, that we would have abundant life. And I want all of us to experience that. And I think a church that loses its influence because we're primarily focused inward is a dangerous thing. It's a drifting church. You forget the power of the very salvation that you proclaim. It changes people's lives. So we want to be influential. Thrive in focus. We replace selfish ambition with compassion for those who are in need through outreach and missions. That's certainly what we want to live by. And then thrive in generosity. Nobody's more generous than God. Nobody. You know, I, I do think sometimes, like, if resources, Lord, I would like to be trusted with massive resources. <laughs> like, you think, oh, that might solve all my problems. Money does answer some problems, but it don't answer the most important problems. But it can meet specific needs in your life, problems that you might have. I'm not going to lie. People, people walk around, and I think that's one of the, I saw this quote, you know, if, if money is so evil, why does the church want it so badly? I'm like, first of all, that's a dumb statement. I want to go knock on the person's head, like, hey. First of all, money's not evil. It's, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Meaning the love of that money and wanting it so much will drive you to do things that you shouldn't do and you wouldn't, shouldn't desire to do it, right? But God's church should be a generous place. I wonder what would happen if we just said to God, God, we're willing to be vessels of generosity, And just started making decisions based on, Lord, I'm going to pray about this. This is what... Now, I don't think you need to pray about meeting some... There's there's needs that are out there. You all know, right? Are you with me? Don't mind. Just pay attention to me just a little longer. I'm almost done. Why why is this significant? Why, Why is it important that we discover and maintain a spirit of generosity? Well, primarily because... If you're out trying to tell somebody who's hungry, you need Jesus. And they can't hear you over what their stomach is saying. I've been there. I know what I'm I'm talking about. Churches that are screaming about Jesus and salvation, but you you can't think of nothing but getting something in your belly. I've been there. Think of any need. Generosity opens people up to hear the message of salvation. Are you buying people? No. Come on. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. So that you and me and everybody who hears this wonderful message of salvation can know what it means to truly be saved. And we know, the Bible says, that you've got to be born again. You can't enter the kingdom of God by earning it. You can't enter it by just being a little better, being a little more righteous. None of that will get you any closer to an eternal life in Christ heaven, the things that we long for. You can't be righteous enough on your own. You can't be good enough on your own. God showed us generosity so that we would be generous advancing His kingdom. We got got mission. We got purpose. These are the things that will keep us from drifting. 
every once in a while I have to, like I, I, I wish I, this is not how I'm geared, but I, I need to do better at memorizing. Every once in a while I have to walk out into the lobby, take a right out these doors right here, go over to the wall, turn and look at it. Oh man. Lord have mercy. I think I'll turn back this way. That's called denial. I'm in denial. Why do I go out there and do that? So that I can get focused on the essentials. They may not be, they may not be what everybody else and every other church wants to do, but this is what, what I say God wants us to do. So I'm going to focus my attention on these things so that I don't drift. be the worst thing in the world to get to the end of life thinking that you've lived on purpose and to discover that you missed the mark. Not, not for the lack of God trying to speak to you and orient you around the most important things that He has for you, but, but that we just didn't listen. We're too busy doing something that, that we didn't let God speak to us plainly. And I want to end this series by saying to you, God wants us to focus on the fundamentals that will make this church thrive in our purpose. Loving people, drawing closer to God in intimacy, that we would make it our mission to, to get people to know Jesus and to know Him intimately. Man. Sometimes I have to remind myself that God is a good God because I grew up in a way that sometimes you thought God was just mad at you all the time pay attention to what he's saying to you it's important he's speaking to you and he wants you to hear what he's saying don't lose your focus now God I'm focused help me Help me run the race in such a way to win the race. He wants you to win. He wants you to win. I think he wants Thrive to win. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I think of some of the greatest men and women who have walked this earth. whether it's great in the business world, in the arena of sports, or whatever area of expertise that people have become great in, they did so by practicing fundamentals. They stayed close to the most important stuff. And I think of how you're speaking to us this morning and how you desire for us to stay close, not only to our core theology, the things that matter doctrinally, but also to the things that we say are values and their core values, and not just because we say them, but because we live them. I pray today that you would help us to orient ourselves around the things that we believe you've spoken to us. I pray your blessing on us. Lord, may this year end in a prosperous way that we would have life and life to the abundant that we would thrive and as we begin the new year and we don't want to be presumptuous should you return we're happy about that but should should you be delayed in your return i pray that we would have the most prosperous blessed year to date help us lord to focus on the fundamentals pray your blessing over us now in Jesus name. Amen. Let me say to you, on your way out today, everyone should take and turn the corner. You can get on our website and see the same thing, but turn the corner and take a picture of our core values and our purpose statement. Take a picture of it and just pray this week and ask the Lord, am I living this stuff out? Is this the stuff that makes up my life? Am I thriving with Thrive Church? I want to be that person that is hitting on all cylinders 
because I'm doing what God has called me to do. Bless you.